Good morning. Um, my name is Louis Mantia. Uh, as, as we were saying, uh, I'm a, a principal designer at Pacific Helm. Uh, we founded the company last year, and uh, since then we've kind of just been working on uh, with clients on making their apps look great. Um, a little background on myself. Five years ago, I worked at uh, Tapulous. Tapulous was a company that, as we heard before, made Tap Tap Revenge. Uh, Jessica Khan kind of elaborated. There was many apps that uh, Tapulous made, and uh, we kind of just made all of these. Tap Tap Revenge worked. The other ones didn't. Icon Factory was a company that I worked at in North Carolina. We made uh, Twitterific. Twitterific is a really cool Twitter app on the Mac, the iPhone, the iPad. And I worked at Apple, and at Apple, I worked on uh, iTunes, GarageBand, iPhoto, just a bunch of little apps there you may have heard of before. Um, Square, I worked there at, uh, you know, Jim Poles was saying earlier, they have two apps. There's Square Wallet, and there's uh, Square Register. And now I work at Pacific Helm, where uh, I work with Brad, Jesse Clarko. Brad is not here today. These are those cool kids. They're right sitting right over there. Look at them. Pacific Helm, we make apps look great, or good, whatever is on my slide. Why? This is important. This is important just like bugs, just like crashes, things that your users will know when they're wrong. This is a review on the App Store. Probably the biggest impediment to this app success is how ugly it looks. Anybody who has an app on the App Store probably has seen reviews like this because we all have crashes. This is a realization, right? We're all going to fail in some regard, but your users are going to be vocal, even this 13-year-old who thinks he knows everything, but he was right. So I want to talk about aesthetics. A wise man once said, design is how it works. This is a mantra that many UI designers use to legitimize making sure that their stuff is paid attention to, that it's very important, that it's not just how it looks and feels like, which is actually what Steve said just before this that is often rem uh, removed. So I want to talk about what it looks like and feels like. And I want to talk about app icons, because app icons is that first thing that your user will see. What is an app icon? I mean, everyone has seen them. They're all over our phones. We have a bunch of them on there, and your app is going to sit alongside all these other ones. But what's the goal? The goal of your app icon is that users should be able to see it and recognize it when they're looking for it. That's the first thing that needs to happen with your app icon. It is not necessarily about advertising. It's about making sure that when a user is looking for your app, they can find it very quickly. And on that note, good app icons are most valuable for everyday users, not for that first-time shopper. Because, of course, we only buy an app once, then it's on all of your devices. There's no reason that you have to cater to that one time as opposed to the person that is using your app every single day. They're the people that you need to pay attention to. Now, this is an icon that we've seen thousands of times. We've tapped thousands of times. Steve introduced it on stage as the first thing when he introduced iPhone. The ideal icon is going to use shape, color, and texture kind of together to form a memorable mark. This is, these three things are crucial for your app icon so that it stands out on its own so that a user can recognize it. Here's some other two icons that maybe you're familiar with. But as you can see, all three of these share those same exact features. There's the phone shape, there's the mail envelope shape, there's the music note shape. They all have a very distinct, vibrant color, and they all have a unique texture. You got stripes, clouds, and some grungy texture thing, whatever. This should be your goal. This is your aim, to have an icon that looks as good as this, that it works as well as these. Because when I'm looking for any one of these three apps, it's not hard to find that on my phone. It's pretty easy. Keep in mind that all obvious ideas have already been used. If you're making a shopping app, 
maybe a shopping cart isn't the way to go. People have done this already. And you know what? It's actually not that great. When you think about it, Zappos and Amazon especially, what do they do besides selling you stuff? That's their primary goal. That's what they do. So why show a shopping cart? Apple has retail stores, unlike the other two, and you wouldn't be caught dead with a shopping cart inside one of their stores. I mean, could you imagine if that was on the front of the Apple store instead of just the Apple logo, but they had the shopping cart outline and they had the thing in there? A nightmare. So why not do something more like this? Something that is a little bit simpler that gets the point across, right? Zappos is about shoes. Everyone's familiar with the Amazon logo, and the Apple logo that you see on the front of the Apple store is really iconic. I mean, in fact, just looking out here, you can see on the back of all of your laptops, most of them, they all look like that. They all look like that, and they look like that because when you buy it from the Apple store, that's what you see on the top of the Apple store. The icon, the product. So in that vein, borrow styles that you're already using from your app. If your app has already a unique design, use that. You know, Find My Friends has leather, and it's often made fun of, but the thing is that the leather in the icon is the same as the one in the app. They use these glyphs with dark colors. They have stitching around it. It looks like its app. The user's not going to confuse this. They're going to know that that's the app that you know, correlates to the icon. If your app is a full screen map, you might as well do the same with your icon, because then a user knows to get maps, click the maps. Same with books. You're, already, you're using this wonderful wood throughout the entire design of your app. Use that in your icon. Take inspiration for real life. There's tons of things in the world that probably correlate to what you're doing with your app. There's already something out there. Routesy, for example, this first icon is an app for uh, seeing transit times in the city of San Francisco. Deliveries is one that you can check deliveries uh, status for packages coming into your house. And trailers is an app where you can check trailers, show times, movies that are coming up, buy tickets, that sort of thing. And Routesy, if you're not familiar, if you're not from San Francisco, it may not mean anything to you, but anyone who's lived here and had a Muni Pass before knows it looks just like the ticket that you get when you're trying to get on the bus. So just like you're using this every day, you're going to be using this every day, both of them together at the same time. You're going to be looking at them. So why not make them look the same? Because I think this is adorable, because I understand exactly what this means. Now, delivery status works the same way, right? I mean, if I'm wondering where my shipment is, I'm going to tap the thing that looks like that. And this is so perfect because it matches the color. It's the same large white shipping label you get on boxes. It's great. In trailers, if you've ever been to Hollywood and walked down the Walk of Fame, you'll know the movie stars on the sidewalk all have the symbol on it of the real camera, right? You have the luscious red carpet there. It reminds you of Hollywood. It reminds you of films. So take inspiration from real life. There's really good examples of this on the App Store. This is not uncommon these days, having a Mac companion app and an iPhone app or an iOS app. So make sure that when you make an icon for both, or you get someone to make one for you, make sure those icons share similarities. Like, for example, the Coda leaf on the left, you know, the Mac app at the bottom there, is, Coda is a wonderful app. It's, you know, if you haven't used it, you should definitely check it out if you do any sort of HTML or CSS, that sort of thing. But you can see the shape, color, and texture are used on that top icon there. You know, you have the outline of the leaf, just like at the bottom. You have the raindrops. Instead of being the, uh, the individual raindrops on the leaf, the drop is the leaf. And you have that texture of the leaf behind it. Now, Things is a to-do list app. They had a Mac app first. And in the Mac app, they, uh, they, have, a, they have a kind of a skewed box with the to-do list papers. And bringing that all the way kind of forward so you can see the top-down view fits that iOS icon shape perfectly. And it matches. And this is important. All of these are great examples of marrying these styles together, but understanding the limitations and expectations of both. That way, your users, when they see it and they use things, they know that when they tap on an icon that looks very similar, they can expect the same experience, because they should. If you have a suite of apps, and this is a common case for people who are making a bunch of apps on the App Store, they have ones that relate to each other. 
And if you have a company, right, that you're making these for, you might want to family these together. Here's some examples. Nike Plus. Nike Plus does this really brilliantly. We're all familiar with a Nike swoosh, so that shape is just great, having it there repeated multiple times over all of their apps. But they also have the same diagonal gloss running through the middle, and they have a plane at the bottom. These family extremely well, and they all have their own shape, color, and texture, but the shape is so similar between all three of them that you can make the connection between all three of them. Facebook is another great example of marrying them, but on color. No one would, you know, no one would not remember that Facebook blue. They see that whenever they go to Facebook, whenever they open a Facebook app. If they're downloading another one of their apps, they're going to notice that same Facebook blue. Even though it doesn't say Facebook, you're going to know that that's related only because of the color. An environment. And this one is particularly interesting because this doesn't have to do with the same shape, the same color, or necessarily even the same texture, but the environment. The environment is so similar just because it has the same plane, the same backing. I mean, GarageBand came out first, and they introduced this icon. And when you look at iPhoto and iMovie, when they released their apps, they followed suit. They have a plane at the bottom and a background. And that icon sits in the middle of it, which is really interesting, and families all three of these apps beautifully together. Style. This one's a little harder to explain, but if you see these icons, you've, you're all familiar with them on Mac OS X, all the whole iWork suite. But using that same color of the, of the tile in the background, the gloss in the middle, the style, I mean, if you look at the bar chart on the right, a similar bar chart is on the keynote icon. The metal in the keynote icon is kind of shared with a pen on the pages icon. All three of these work together because they share the same style. Now, I admit, I have no idea how to make a game icon. So if you're a game developer out there, I think actually what you have to do is just put your primary character in a yellow square, because that seems to be what you're supposed to do. I don't know. It seems to work for all of these guys. Remember that your app icon is going to be among many others on the home screen. Your goal is to be memorable. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I believe my mic is working, yes? Wonderful. I will apologize up front for my accent. Unlike most of your speakers, I'm from all the way over in Ireland, which means two things. I speak fast and drink lots. But uh, I won't be doing the drinking, just the speaking. So <clears throat> I'm here to talk not about, uh, well, I'm talking about the design of text, but not at a typographical level, but more so choosing the words you put into your, uh, into your product. So people call this copy or microcopy or content or microcontent or any of that. I am Des Trainer, by the way, in case you forgot. Um, so when we talk about microcopy and products, usually we talk about this sort of stuff. We talk about like what words you put on buttons, what labels you put on forms, how do you inform users? Is that okay? Yeah, everyone can read it. Uh, how do you inform users what they should be doing or saying on any given screen? Uh, a couple of days ago, Mig Reyes, who's a great designer for 37 Signals, he wrote a nice post that design was all about words, and he backed that up by showing a lot of web products where the words were taken away and you realize that there's pretty much nothing left. Uh, I thought that was an interesting idea because it's just as true in, in uh, iOS apps. Words tell you what to do in a product. So if you launch audio and that happens, you don't have a clue what you're doing because the words have gone. Similarly, if I open up Gmail and this happens, you start to realize how dependent you are Oh, yeah, by the way, I just I realized I broke a rule there, uh, so I'm sure Apple will be waiting outside the door for me when I finish. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, without words, these products disappear to nothing. They're effectively, you know, they're absolutely not usable, if you like. Words tell you what to do, but they're also, you launch apps to look at the words in them. If I launch Foursquare and I want to find out what's going on, without the words, there's not much of a product left. Similarly, as we've all been doing throughout this conference, You've been looking at the hash run IO tag. And if this happens, you're not super impressed. You know, there's not much left behind. You get the idea. Also, if you think we have it tough, the guys in, uh, in our, our friends working on Metro have, uh, have it doubly hard. <laughs> that is a Metro app with all the copy removed. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that was really easy because it was Google Plus, so there was no content in the first place. Uh, <laughs> uh, Oh, no, he didn't. Um, but 
the key point on this kind of relates to Google Plus is like apps are a gamble on content, or a lot of them are anyway. Like a lot of the time when you're creating an app, you're hoping the content's going to show up in there from the users. So these guys who sat down and did up this sketch, they bet that for some reason people would write stuff in here and click set. And that went, this is the first sketch ever of Twitter, uh, which is now worth about 10 billion by anyone's standards. But they were just hoping that for some reason we'd all tell people we were eating breakfast. And they got it right. Similarly, Mark thought that we'd all uh, enter everything, all our possible details about our entire lives on the site and poke each other, and he got it right. These guys thought we'd all set up waves at each other, and they got it wrong. That's, anyone remember Google Wave? So, and likewise, Justin is now betting a significant chunk of cash that we're all going to get back into MySpace and start writing shit in there all over again. We're probably not going to do it. You know? The key point is people come to read the content, but the content is created by the people which, as you know, is a chicken and egg problem. Which comes first? <laughs> so. There's always, there's always a wave of laughter as, as it resonates around different parts. But chicken and egg problems have nothing to do with look. It's actually your text that influences what happens. And specifically, the text and the content you put in your product influences three things. Uh, and you can control it in three ways. First of all is the actual the buttons, the text you put on buttons and labels you put in your product. This asks an interesting philosophical question. Does the language you offer influence the behavior you get? Which is actually the superior wharf hypothesis, which is a really debated idea. It's not true in humans, but it is true in interfaces. If somebody pokes me in Facebook, and these are my two options, then Facebook, whether they like it or not, is controlling what my behavior is, because they're only giving me the option of poking them back or not poking them back. The words that you actually put in the interface give the context to what you're doing and the relationships that form within them. So when you think about it, this is actually what happens when somebody tweets. You know, somebody puts in a, you know, they type whatever they want and hits it, and an insert SQL statement gets fired somewhere. That's all a tweet is. And they could have called that button anything. They could have called it share, post, publish, submit, update, set, et cetera. Right? But they didn't. They called it tweet. And that was, like, you know, on one hand, an irrelevant point, right? It, it's absolutely meaningless. We're going to see this again because I pressed the wrong button. Uh, on one hand, the word tweet is kind of irrelevant. On the other hand, it's probably the most important thing in the product whatsoever. If they didn't call it that, we all of a sudden don't have this whole nomenclature around tweeting and retweeting. Similarly, Facebook have this little count that when you submit a comment, people press a button and it increments a count. We call that like. We don't call it appreciate, love, or agree. Now, does the fact that we call it like change people's behavior? Well, it does, because my friend Robbie lost his cat, and no one liked it, right? How can you like a missing cat? You know, what sort of monster are you? Um, you shouldn't like a singer's death, right? You absolutely shouldn't. But conversely, you can plus one these things, because Google Plus went with, like, uh, with plus one as the idea. And plus one comes from like sort of mailing lists. It's that sort of I agree with you sort of thing. But I agree with you is not the same as I like what you said. And they are like two, two fundamentally different things. And again, that's just a piece of text that they put in a button. It doesn't matter, right? But it matters heavily. What a button says has massive implications for the success of a product, regardless of what the button does. Secondly, like when you're doing this, you'll get the content that you ask for. So in plus, you're asked to share what's new. Twitter asks you what's happening. Does anyone remember what Twitter used to ask you? They used to ask you, what are you doing? And that's why you, they used to get things like, I'm eating my breakfast, I'm signing up for Twitter, et cetera. Then they changed it to say what's happening. And now, since it, since it now says what's happening, what they get is news type stuff in Twitter, which wasn't there before. Because now it's not about what are you doing, it's about what's happening. Similarly, Facebook asks you what's on your mind. Um, what, the stuff you surface actually influences how people behave. So Instagram surfaces likes, although they give it a heart icon, which implies love. But uh, People, like, you know, Twitter surfaces tweets everywhere, which means that whenever people tweet, people shoot for retweets, which is why we all write these little witty one-liners to try and to hope that you'll get faved or, or starred or whatever. So as I said, the words that you put in your product have massive implications for what people do. They also have implications for what relationships form. And by relationships, I usually mean person to person. So we've all had this sort of awkward moment where like, you know, you're not sure where you stand in a relationship with somebody, and one of you says, are we dating? And the other person says, I don't know. I didn't really want to call it that. Let's not make it official or whatever. And that's basically what happens when you know, things get weird when you try to put labels on things. So Facebook, you put label friend on what it means to be connected to somebody. 
But then they realized it became so you know, meaningless that they said, all right, I, mean, I remember reading the update from Facebook saying, we've now introduced close friends for the people you're actually friends with. You know, <laughs> it's like, um, like Twitter has this whole following, followee sort of thing, which is I'm okay with the idea of following 459 people, but I'd never tell somebody I'm friends with 459 people. LinkedIn, for example, asks you specifically uh, when you try to add somebody to say, how actually do you know this person? Did you actually work with them? Did, you know, they, they want you to be specific, which kind of cuts through an awful lot of the whole, yeah, let's, let's hook up or let's, let's stay in touch or whatever. Conversely, like Game Center, like, I hate sending these requests because like, it's like, oh, Des would like to be your friend. No, I just want to play letterpress. You know? <laughs> you know, it makes me sound so lonely. Um, but like, bad labels in, the, in your product gets bad data. So uh, that's one sort of thing you have to bear in mind. Whenever you're controlling the, the buttons on your text or the labels in relationships, you have to always be careful that the buttons define the success of your product and the labels define what people do with it. The second thing you control is the blank slate. So when you sign up for Facebook and you have no friends, you get these weird sort of moments. Uh, I had a, a while ago, my mother signed up for Facebook, and she, said, you know, she rang me, and she's like, someone's after writing on my wall. And I was like, and? She's like, I need to clean it. I was like, Jesus. Uh, which is these sort of things here. Like this is a, you know, someone trying to find themselves on Facebook, and like the Tyler is like, yeah, you wrote in your own wall which then set up this Tumblr, which is like concerned children against parents on Facebook, which is funny. Um, but and the same idea happens with Twitter. Like early on when it was the whole, what are you doing? And everyone else was just writing, I'm having breakfast. You just wrote the same thing. Whereas, you know, it's kind of, it behaves like talk radio in that uh, on talk radio, the way it works is typically you get some host. Um, we have plenty of them over in Ireland and Europe. I, I, Rush Limbo would be a great example over here. Somebody just throws out a few like, sort of statements that will provoke chatter and then sits back and lets the chatter come back. But if you don't set the tone correctly early on, what you'll get, I mean, if you, you, know, it's, if you speak a load of moronic stuff, you get a load of morons calling in. You know? uh, that's how talk radio works. And Twitter is not too dissimilar. So it's worth asking when you consider this, how did YouTube comments get this bad this quickly? Like, you know, this is the, uh, the classic XKCD cartoon pointing out how bad YouTube comments are. Um, like, I love this one. If it's real, why is there gravity? Um, but uh, Yahoo Answers is, is obviously the, the classic one we all know. You know. It turns out if you create a website and put in loads of childlike icons and loads of childish tomfoolery and stuff, you get a load of childish nonsense. You know? um, Get Satisfaction is a great example because like, what they do is, this is a, Get Satisfaction is a way you can voice concerns about a product and you know, it's a public forum. And if you try to write something with a load of exclamation marks, they won't let you submit it. They say, go easy on that. E ease off the exclamations. Only one or two should be enough. If you try to go caps lock, they won't let you do that either. They won't let you curse. They, they actually control what, they, what behavior and what content they get. Branch is similar. Branch is set up really well to encourage long form debates. And I mean really long form debates. This is the HTML5 versus iOS thing. My favorite comment in this, by the way, is from MG Siegler, who goes, HTML5 only has itself to blame. I love that idea that, it, that like HTML5 is going to sit down with a bottle of vodka and really reflect on its life, like you know. Uh, but um, if you don't set the tone right, if your app hinges on content, you don't set the tone right. You can't change it afterwards. It's really, really hard. Like no one takes MySpace seriously now because of where they came from. It's really, really hard to make that shift. And the last thing you control is the content definition. So TripAdvisor is a site we all know, and they are a review site. But they don't just take like, you know, one star reviews. If you want to review a hotel on TripAdvisor, you have to do a lot of work. They want to hear all this sort of stuff. And, and they have a big, you know, massive uh, disclaimer at the bottom. But because of that, TripAdvisor is actually a good site. And you, you can actually say, I want to spend a lot of money, but I want a luxurious hotel. Or you can say, I want to stay somewhere good but cheap. You know, and TripAdvisor has that wealth of information. The App Store, however, the App Store reviews are, how shall we say, lacking in that you have one metric to rate, and you have an optional review, which you don't have to provide. And because of that, you get this sort of behavior, right? where it's, you know, this is an amazing app. I use it every day, but 2.99 is a bit steep. You know? Or like any of those sort of things. This app crashed once on me, so I hate it. One star, even though I love the product. You know? Because and what you can't do in the app store is say, I'm willing to spend $25 on an email client, but show me the best one. You know, you, you don't have that option because they just, you just have a spectrum. And unfortunately, as everyone knows, spectrums tend to get a sugar load of one-star reviews and an equal amount of five-star reviews, which means that the best apps tend to be three stars, which isn't actually where they fall. That's the nature of like, bad content definitions. 
if you say that if you ask for reviews along that scale, surprise, surprise, it's not our friend. So where am I going with this? Well, microcopy has to be clear in your product. It has to be brief. It has to be appropriate. And then everyone says, well, what about the icons you use in your product? Well, icons are interesting because there's a few rules you have with icons. You have to be clear, brief, appropriate, and usable. And the reason I include this piece on icons is because they're always the alternative to actual text. Um, so here we can sort of see the clarity. The three most universally understood icons are bold, italic, and underline. After that, you're kind of taking your life in your own hands as you go further down the list, which leaves us with these simple rules that text and an image works better than text, which in turn works better than just an image. The location of an icon is remembered far more often than the actual icon itself. So if you loaded Instagram, you probably don't even look at that bottom middle button anymore. You just know that that's the take the photo to share button. They could change that out with an icon of a bird for all that matters. Like people just hit it. And lastly, if you can't come up with the right icon quickly, there's no chance users are going to understand it. There's a great proportional uh, sense there. So just qu two quick examples. Here's an example of labeling. Everyone remember the Zoom? The Zoom has a killer feature that they never really got advertised. It was you could give your friend three listens over Wi-Fi. So me and you both of Zooms. Let's just say it's a Zoom convention. And I go flick, and you, it starts playing in your thing, and you can listen to it three times. And if you like it, you can buy it at the end. Great idea. I wish we could have that feature today. Where did it go wrong? Well, what, what would they call such a feature? They called it Squirt. <laughs> and then, it, as if people weren't taking this seriously, they wheel out Balmer, who turns out and says, I want to squirt you a picture of my kids, and you can squirt me back a picture of your vacation. That's a software experience. Software experience does not sound like something you have to clean up after. <laughs> so what went wrong with Wave? Well, it's interesting. A wave, what's the button say up here? It doesn't tell you what you're doing. It just says done. And then for your assistive text, which is going to explain to you really what you're doing, it says shift and enter. Now, that's why no one has a clue what the hell this product does. Then they, they, they call things like a new wave. No one knew what a wave was. Surprise, surprise, no one created waves. And because of this, you get this sort of thing, right? <laughs> or my favorite side on this was What's easier to understand? And the people voted the mating habits of the red-sided garter snake is easier to understand <laughs> than Google Wave. <laughs> so what? So you get the content you deserve. Bad labels, bad data, vague action, no action, playful tone, playful behavior, vague relationships, meaning relationships, weird words, no one will say them. How does it go wrong? Well, here's my pet theory about what happens. We have a process that's loosely wireframe design, build, QA, release. And if you put in a button that sounds OK, it comes out OK, but no one ever really thought about it. If you put in a button like, you know, if you don't try and guess it, someone at some point will have to catch it and go, you know what, we really need to think about all the copy because it actually matters. It doesn't always work, however. That, that was PayPal's infamous example. Um, that's, that was a live example from PayPal. Uh, <laughs> so how do we ensure it gets, simple, uh, gets suitable attention? Well, just this is an example of how we work in Intercom. That's Intercom, by the way. I get requests like this. What do we say on the screen? Well, the user has already clicked archive, but the message is already archived with some other team, so they can't double archive, but it's not an error. At the same time, it didn't happen. Oh, yeah, and this. And I'm just like, oh, Jesus, guys, give me a break. But like every single content, this is what a content request looks like. Someone's saying, we need, we need the text for this button. So we break it down. Who are we talking to? Is it first run users, paid users, buyers, sellers, all users? What are we saying? Are we saying change your setting, make a purchase, this can't be done, you don't have permission? How are we saying it? Is it casual, business English, abundantly clear, cute and funny? When are we saying it? When they launch the product, immediately on screen, on screen from right now, during working hours in their time zone? And then how are they going to get it? Is it an email, a flash message, text in a product, a push notification, an audio effect? So we take something like this, and we boil it down to this. The who, what, when, when, and how, sorry, who, what, when, why, and how. And because of that, we can produce an error message that makes sense. What doesn't make sense is stuff like this, error duplicate archive. People don't know what that means. Message is already archived. This has been archived by you or one of your colleagues. I love these types of messages because it's like, I don't really know, but I, I know I'm the product. But, uh, um, so you're shooting for here this sweet spot between too long didn't read and too short didn't understand. And on the left, you've got done. And on the right, you've got a paragraph of text explaining something. And in our case, we might like to say a simple example of Dave archived this two minutes ago. And you're like, right, that makes sense. The amount of different ways that I could have come up with badly is quite shocking. But that's, why con that's how content gets forgotten. The world, I'll just leave you a couple examples. Uh, the world is filled of great copy like this. So has anyone ever seen the CD Baby confirmation mail? Derek Sivers wrote an email to say thank you for purchasing a CD. 
instead of saying, you know, do not reply to this mail, your order number is 117, blah, he writes, thank you for your order at CD Baby. Your CD has been gently taken for a CD Baby shelves with sterilized, contamination-free gloves and placed onto a satin pillow. And it goes on and on. A theme of, you know, a, a love, a hush falls over the crowd and a candle was lit. You know, it goes on and on. What, ha what happened with this content, right? This could have just been, do not reply to this email, blah, blah, blah. This, if you search for any string here, you'll see about 100,000 people have like, blogged about this in different ways or shapes or forms. And that's really, really useful for a product because now that's so many more people who know about CD Baby that never did before. That's like, and again, that was just, I could have phoned it in on a copy or I could have thought about it for more than 10 seconds, you know? MailChimp are great at this. Every single time you go to MailChimp, they have a new login screen. Like, like you know, MailChimp is for lovers on Valentine's Day, but like, you know, three days later, it ha has the monkey getting drunk because it's St. Patrick's Day. Like, they just keep it coming. Like, um, it doesn't have to always be funny. It can just be like clear and appreciative. Like, I really feel the panic we're saying thank me, th thank you. The alternative is like, you know, a horrible again, do not reply to my mail type thing. I love this example from Bustle and iOS app. <laughs> The loading thing says we're making up the bus routes. You know, that it's a bus, uh, it's a, you know, it's supposed to tell you, but they just tell you they're making stuff up. Uh, this is from Stitcher. It's like, pick up the phone and call someone. You've just listened to five hours of Stitcher. It's like, there's some cool stuff out there. The real world is even better. Has you ever, ever seen this one? Come in and try the worst meatball sandwiches that one guy in Yelp ever had in his life. <laughs> Again, you see that, and you're going to go in there, and you're probably going to eat the damn meatballs. Like, you know? <laughs> Uh, another one, uh, this is a coffee shop in Dublin, this next one, it's, uh, you know, we've all seen that sign, children must be, uh, you know, no children after seven, or your children must be looked after, or supervised, whatever. They all sound kind of rude. This is a much nicer way to say it. Un unattended children will be given an espresso and a free kitten. <laughs> <laughs> like, you read that, you laugh, but you also get the point, and you don't hate them, right? It's a wonderful piece of work. Uh, I saw this in London. So your content is not always canonical. You can change it for users. It's always an opportunity to delight your user. Every time you type a string of text, think, what am I really shooting for here? Am I just phoning it in or am I really going for it? It's always the lowest hanging fruit in your app, genuinely. If you ever want to just freshen things up, the content is the easiest place to go. Just one last point is just like in Dribble, say, like the, you, the sort of visual design form, we have like these sort of things where people post an, uh, post an image and someone says, the red shape behind the tree could perhaps use some inner shadow or something to make it look like it belongs there. And that's fair enough. Like We should obsess over things like that. But no one's ever saying, I see you've got three messages and there's three in the inbox. Or, like, what, what's the difference between those two things? Are my messages not in my inbox? You know, no one ever asks those type of questions. Like, we obsess over like the pixels and shadows and typefaces and borders and gradients, but why don't we obsess over the words? That's always going to be the higher, the higher order piece here. Like, where is a dribble for word? Imagine if we had, like, something where you could share a piece of copy and everyone can review it and sort of say, here's how you should write it. I think that'd be a cool idea. Last piece I want to say, good words are, well, they cost little and they're worth a whole lot. And my name is Des Trainer. Thank you very much for your time listening to me. Oh, So we've got a little bit of time here at the end for uh, some Q&A. Um, we have to take that off so we can pass it. <clears throat> right. Oh, sorry, we got a hand mic. We got a hand mic. Much better. So um, I'll start by asking a couple questions. But if you've got questions for either one of these guys, just uh, put up your hand. And we have uh, Tim and uh, Bill with mics out there. So. One thing I was curious about in your presentation was, what do you do when you localize an app? What, what happens when you have to hit that barrier to all this great strategy about text? Yeah, so it's it's tricky. If you're, I mean, like there's a hierarchy there. There's like localization, localization, internationalization, and translation, right? And at the lowest form, we've got translation, which is like make sure that this word translates to its perfect uh, equivalent. And for simple things like submit or first name or surname, where you really can't push the boat out and be clever. Yeah, it's just translation. But when you get into like localization, you, and say if you want to make a joke, you have to then make a, a, a culture acceptable joke. So you really kind of like we divide our copy into the stuff that you know this is just you know we're not trying to like uh, push the boat out with this sort of stuff. It's functional and it has to be functional and that's it. And then there's other things like you know welcome mails, sign up mails, uh, like you know you have we haven't seen you in 30 days, please come back. Those type of things. That's when we try to uh, sort of say right. 
Like, you know, what, what, you know, is this sort of thing still funny when you put it into Spanish? No, it's not. Okay, let's talk to somebody who's Spanish and let's get, like, you know, let's explain to them what we're going for and let's find a funny equivalent there, you know. So, uh, you know, the low level functional stuff, you know, it's just a mapping. I mean, you, you have issues around, like, you know, a string might be longer or shorter in different languages. But it's when, when you are trying to be cool, clever, intelligent, friendly, whatever, you do have to get, like, uh, you know, people who have, like, significant local experience to help. So that's the short answer. So, have you ever seen this work well? I mean, does it, can it be done? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just given enough, uh, I guess, good localization experience, then. Uh. Yeah, it's and, and like the key thing is, you know, you have to make it clear that you're not looking for a literal translation. Yes. Uh, that that's that the key sense. thing is that like, you have to say, look, we want to be funny, but here's the message. What does that sound like in Portuguese? You know. Oh. Um, Louis, uh, another thing I'm curious about is I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, what what icons out there today besides the ones in your deck you think work either really well or really not well, given the principles you've uh, you've given us here. Now I gotta look on my phone, I gotta see which ones I really don't really like or something. Um, I don't know. I mean, like like I said, and I think in my in my talk, it was there's anyone that uses a predominant shape is one that I will recognize immediately, right? So I don't know if I can cite any specific examples, but you know. Do, like, do you think shape is underused as an icon principle, maybe on the iPhone? I think so. I think a lot of people try to make something that is really detailed, something that is um, like a, a very realistic ship or something if they have a game. And, and again, I don't know how to make game icons, but you know, something that is a little bit more, maybe if they used an anchor instead of, you know, I, Harbor Master is a great icon actually. And Harbor Master has an anchor for the icon instead of using a ship which is all about that game, right? And I think that that's a really great way to get the same message across, right? This is a game about ships, so use an anchor. And don't try to mash in your logo into a tiny square. Yeah, I, I, think, probably uh, yeah, I think a lot of people try, I mean, especially when you have an art-heavy app, you want to kind of cram all of the art that you have in your app into the icon. And that can be really tempting to do because it looks great. But uh, at this size, I'm not really so sure. Do you have views on other platforms? I mean, one thing I kind of noticed is Apple is sort of unique in that they tend to discourage having app titles on the icon. Other platforms go the other way. Um, you know, the, uh, the bookstore tablets, for example, often display icons in this kind of uh, screen, um, cover share type format, um, and there's no titles. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have experience with, with other platforms besides just iOS and Android and Mac, um, but, you know. Oh, yeah, so that's the, is, is your Android approach different or similar to your iOS approach? Well, I, I, think the, I think the Android approach is slightly different, right? Because y even though you still have basically the same format, you have the icon and then the label, you have uh, you have alpha that you can use, which is something you don't get to use in, in iOS, right? Because you have to fill the entire square. And they're going to crop it to the rounded shape for you. But on Android, you get a little bit more flexibility. You can make something kind of more like a desktop icon, right? Where you can make the shapes actually be represented, which is really great. Like uh, when, when I was working at Square, we made a few that, like when we were working on um, Square Wallet, for instance, we made a few icons that kind of broke out of just that square icon, which was great because you know you look at all of those and that becomes a different, uh, a different recognizing point for you. So you recognize that overall shape instead of just the rounded rect, which we don't get on iOS. Oh, I think there's a question there. Uh, this is about uh, the microcopy and text uh, over here by oh, Bill. Sorry. Here. That's all right. No problem. Um, do you recommend uh, a, a little bit, a lot of testing of the, the text with, you know, maybe focus groups is probably the, a bad word, right? But, you know, with real people that are non, how, how much of that makes sense? Sure. So, uh, so like we'll divide this into two things, right? One, you can A-B test these things to see if they're affecting conversions, et cetera. Absolutely go nuts. But like, I think what you're really talking about is uh, when you're trying to come up with the copy, how do you work out what works? And it comes down to there's a few things. If you do like an open focus group, like we've, uh, like, you know, my previous career as a UX consultant, you'd sit down with like a load of, say, people who are about to buy cell phone contracts, and you're trying to work out what language do they use to refer to things like minutes, SMS counts, etc. And we don't, we, we just want to find out what the predominant language is. So you make sure you've got like a domain, uh, sorry, a good sample of your target domain. And you talk to them, and you gather all the different lingo. Like, you know, as in people call it text count, people call it SMS, people call it, you know, minutes, people call it like call time, etc. Get a list of all those, and like that's your sort of your research piece. So, what 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 is the like the nomenclature in this area? Secondly, then you've got your validation. So, as in, you then create interfaces using each of these and take them back to it, like you know a different focus group, and you make sure that everyone understands whatever terms you've settled on. So, so one part of it is like we don't know what we don't know what what words we should use. Let's observe. 
And then the other part is we've made our choice, let's validate. And I, that's kind of, do I recommend it? Yeah, if, if you're, it, it's much like icons. If you can't come up with a clear way to describe an action or something like that in your interface, uh, the chances are using one word like merge or something like that won't like, you know, resonate with the people who are using it. So you know, that's, this is why you have to check these things. All right, I think we're uh, about out of time, but that was a great session, guys, and thank you all. Um, we will now take a 10-minute break.